You want the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth about sports in the state of Michigan? You can't handle the truth! Well, we're giving you the Michigan Sports Truth Podcast on Stables Media, the show that provides research and statistics about all the Detroit and Michigan sports teams, whether fans like it or not, and detects, exposes, and reveals actual and hidden facts and truth that the mainstream media doesn't want you to know. No junk, no entertainment, no homerism, no slappiness, no coddling, no pop culture, no conspiracy theories, no opinions, no shilling, and no fluff. Head over to our website, the Michigan Sports Truth Podcast, podcast.com follow us on twitter periscope and instagram at michigan underscore truth and like and share our verified facebook page the michigan sports truth podcast also listen to us on spreaker Castbox, iHeartRadio, radio google podcast apple podcast via itunes and spotify and like staples media on facebook <laughs> The Michigan Sports Truth Podcast does not represent or defame any of the teams it covers, nor does it represent or compete against any mainstream media in the state of Michigan. It is also not for entertainment or debating purposes. It only detects, exposes, and reveals honest, actual, and hidden truth, facts, and statistics about them. And it is for every sports fan's own good because the truth is out there. And welcome to another episode of the Michigan Sports Truth Podcast Primetime Edition on Stables Media. I'm Taylor Phillips, along with Ed Smith and Frank Vesner. Darren Weiss is out again, but he will be back next week. Ed Smith, how was your week, and how are you doing tonight? Uh, doing quite well, Taylor. Thank you so much for asking. Um, today was a little bit longer than expected, but uh, um, after seeing what I just witnessed in the past few minutes, it's uh, making my day feel a lot better. Yep, me too. Frank? Well, my week's been uh, pretty much having my nose in work and Amazon. I know today that we were setting a uh, fulfillment center goal of doing a mil- of stowing a million units. So I think by shift send we were about halfway there. Hopefully we uh, the night shift ends up reaching that goal and also finding out the Pistons got their point guard of the future tonight and possibly some other moves that GM Troy Weaver made. Uh, leads me to believe that uh, there's another GM in this town that's not afraid to shake the tree. Absolutely. I guess Tom Gores made the right decision to hire Troy Weaver as the general manager, and we'll get to those moves momentarily. Before we get started, we want to remind everyone to download the all-new social sports app called Viget, which influences more and more people to love sports. It's a social network, plus you can predict which team you think can win. Enter the referral code STABLES with a capital S when you sign up. The referral code STABLES with a capital S and a B in the middle. Download the Viget app and enter the referral code STABLES with a capital S and a B in the middle when you sign up. Got some Pistons, got some Antonio Brown stuff to take care of plus Michigan State, Michigan, and Lions, who obviously blew a 21-point lead but still emerged victorious in regulation. And then our closing statement. So uh, let's get to it. The Pistons have drafted point guard Killian Hayes from Radio Farm Alm, France. Before that, they traded a future first-round pick to the Houston Rockets for Trevor Ariza and this year's 16th overall pick. Before that, they traded for Bruce Brown to the Brooklyn Nets for shooting guard Dezan and Musa in a 2021 second-round pick. And before that, they exercised for Tony Snell's player option for $12.1 million. So let's get to this uh, draft pick number seven before we get to the uh, Trevor Arisa trade. Ed, uh, we'll start with you, and then we'll go to Frank with our What's Your Great segment. Killian Hayes, a point guard from Radio Farm Home France. Ed, what is your grade on that? My grade on this one would have to be a solid A. Uh, This was, quite frankly, the best move that the Pistons could have made, given the spot that they were in. Uh, This was a spot to where, since they weren't a top three or even in the top five in the lottery, uh, this was a situation where, unless you were making a move that was going to put you in that range, this was a select the best player available type of deal. And knowing that the guys guys like LaMelo Ball or Anthony Edwards or James Wiseman, uh, for, uh, for example... Uh, those guys, they were going to be gone, well gone before it even got to you, unless you made a, a severely drastic move that involved giving up a piece you probably didn't want to give up, plus future picks. So avoid all of that craziness and confusion. Uh, luckily, you found a suitor in the Houston Rockets who, you know, quite coincidentally or ironically, they're in the middle of going through a makeup roster shift themselves. So why not help them uh, with that expedition by getting something in return for yourself? So the fact that you got draft capita 
Plus, you got Trevor Ariza, and my view is a, a, a veteran player that could help your younger guys, especially guys, your winger, your younger wings, like your uh, Svi Michalix, or your recently uh, acquired Zanaran Musa, the player that you just mentioned uh, that we got in exchange for the Bruce Brown trade, or helping out our, our you know, our young Killing Hayes here. Uh, I'll get to, that, get to him in a second more. But um, I like the Trevor Ariza pickup. I like the fact that the guy's an extra draft pick. And I like the fact that we didn't really do anything stupid. We just, we were patient. We let the best, best player available fall to us. And knowing that this is a draft to where you have more potential to find something in this class as compared to the class before even uh, uh, one in the past, like say 2013 or 14, uh, you feel more confident in, in your ability to find a player that's going to help out with your needs, with your system, and what makeup you want to have for your team going forward. And knowing that the, the fact that the Pistons obviously were not going to end up as, be in a position where they're one pick away or one spot away from being a contender, no. They're going to sit back, kick their feet up, um, knowing the fact that, A, thank God we don't have to deal with um, paying Josh Smith anymore, and B, knowing for the fact that we're going to have more cap space coming up in the next couple of years, i.e. making that tra- transition away from Blake Griffin. We've already done it for Reggie Jackson. we already did it from Andre Drummond. We know very well um, because unless the team says, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll buy out, we'll get his contract now from you, we'll take it off your hands. I see, I see us still hanging on to Blake Griffin, at least to his contract expires, but still, knowing the pieces that you've made so far in changing your, your design of your roster, the scheme of what you want to go with moving forward, knowing you have a sequel to Mboya, knowing that for now at least you still have a Luke Kennard. Um, I wasn't so sure about Bruce Brown, as, and as you saw what happened, then I, I was proven to be right, uh, but you do have a Tony Snell that decided to opt in. You do have a Svi Michaela that I view, uh, a sharpshooter that, that you got from the Lakers that can help you out here. Um, you have length and size uh, with some of these guys, especially with the guy you just acquired from, from, for uh, flipping Bruce Brown. Uh, that gives you help with length and defense. And trust me, if you're in the same division as a team that has Giannis Antetokounmpo, you're going to need all the length and health and defense that you can get. So um, I don't mind making this move. And as for young Killian Hayes, for this young man here, uh, with his size, his six foot inside of his six foot five frame, the way he moves and uses his body throughout the court, where it, where it would be going to the rim or using as a, as a floater over the defender. Um, he has the size to uh, not only be a capable point guard, but, you know, stack himself up well with some of the other uh, bigger point guards in the league uh, with his size and the fact that he is defensive-minded. And not to mention, the dude can pass. He has absolute um, if, this, if this were 2K, I guess you could say he would have the dime, um, Hall of the dimer badge on Hall of Fame level. Uh, the way that he's able to, even in mid-shift as he's going up in the air for a possible fake-out or, or a layup, he can, in mid-air transition, find a guy open in the corner or on the wing with, with, with a pass. That's something you can't teach. That's something you're born with, I feel. And Hayes has that uh, innate ability to make those kinds of passes, and he's still young enough and has the awareness level to do that as well. And I think he's in this in his situation he's gonna be coming to a team where the pressure will not be on him as well. So he will he will have time to develop other things of his game that may need more improvement, i.e. his jump shot where he's shooting less than thirty percent from, from three point range, uh, for example. So there's uh, obviously things that you could like to see more from his game, but knowing what he has on his on his resume now and what his potential could be, and the fact that you got him and he's going to be in your system with your young players, I highly approve of this move. Very happy for this move. Solid A. Good job, Ed Stefanski. Terrific job by Troy Weaver. Definitely. Frank, what's your grade? Yours has to be an A as well. So is mine. Well, you would be absolutely right about that, Taylor. Pistons went out and addressed a need, getting their point guard of the future, and they got him in Killian Hayes. I mean, from what I did see about him on the draft, the guy can create inside and outside. I know Ed mentioned that his jumper needs some work, but the guy also defends as well. And he's got great court vision, which maybe even borderline elite. We'll see when he gets there. And I think also the fact that you have Sekou Dumboya on the team, and plus, that's another French guy. I think maybe you potentially have a French connection in your backcourt. I mean, that's 
probably just a little something to throw out there for promotional purposes. But yeah, this is a guy you want to be your point guard. Obviously, you weren't going to get a LaMelo Ball or an Anthony Edwards unless you were going to give up more assets to trade up into the top three. So you took the best available, and this isn't a team that's going to obviously contend next season or in two seasons, but you know, they're building there. This was a step they had to take. So now you've got one piece. You can obviously get more later on in this draft tonight. We'll see where they go there. But I would say so far, this one's getting made for me. Yeah, and not to mention the fact of, of what you mentioned, Frank, about who they want to get or, or they could get in terms of a rebuild. This was not a, you know, make them or break them type of deal with this pick. You could have... Uh, be given a mulligan with this pick if you wanted to, um, knowing of where you were and how the lottery itself fell out for you. So the fact that you got this kid at seven uh, speaks to your fortune. And the fact that, you know, like I said, this wasn't really a draft where I wasn't too heavily invested in, in terms of the talent that's around them uh, and the fact of where they could have been potentially. So let's say in whether it be next year, two years or three years from now, uh, we're looking at a draft where we could see them look for possibly getting a Cade Cunningham or, in my personal selfish view, hopes rather, an Imani Bates. Those are the drafts that I will be paying more attention to, depending on how they would go, uh, knowing uh, where they are in the division and the conference, how they perform over the next couple of years, and knowing that they've made some moves, roster changes moves already, makes me leads me to believe that if they play their cards right, we could see them ending up with one of those potential franchise-changing draft picks in the next couple of years or so, if they play their cards right. Definitely. So we're going to get to that 16th overall pick when it comes. This is live coverage of the NBA Draft 2020. So with all that being covered, let's get to our uh, Antonio Brown story from ESPN. Headlining, Antonio Brown allegedly wrecked the camera but wasn't charged before joining Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Here we go. Antonio Brown was accused last month by the community in which he lives of destroying a security camera and then throwing a bicycle at a security guard on October 15th. Gruesome. According to the Miami Herald on Monday, citing a police report. The Hollywood, Florida police decided they had probable cause to charge Brown with criminal mischief, a misdemeanor, but the president of the Hollywood Oaks Homeowners Association declined to press charges, the Herald reported. According to the report, President Sylvia Berman told police she feared Brown, quote, may retaliate against her employees, unquote. Berman told the Herald, quote, we're not afraid, unquote, of Brown, but instead the Hollywood Oaks board decided the incident wasn't serious enough to press charges and that the now Tampa Bay Buccaneers wide receiver agreed to fix the camera that was damaged. Elena Burstyn, a spokeswoman for Brown, told the newspaper that any issues between the Homeowners Association and Brown, quote, have been fully and amicably resolved, and everyone is getting along just fine, unquote. She added, quote, I'm not sure who is trying to promote this narrative, unquote. In a second statement sent to the Herald, Burstyn said, quote, Antonio regrets that he lost his cool that day, and he has made amends with the Hollywood Oaks Homeowners Association. However, he is rightly concerned that he is routinely targeted by some people for mistreatment and undue scrutiny because he is Antonio Brown. He wants to be a good neighbor, good citizen, and a good teammate, unquote. The case was closed by the Hollywood Police Department on November 5th, the Herald reported. And that's the end of this article. I'm not going to get to the entire article because uh, the rest of it includes his past troubles, like throwing a leg of chair off of a 14-foot balcony and others. But to recap, as we go to Ed and then Frank, as always, Antonio had been a troublemaker as of late, but the report shows that he lost his cool and probably no charges, therefore, were going to be necessarily pressed by anyone. Again, as the article pointed out, he lost his cool, he fixed the camera, everything's good. Ed, we'll start with you. Yeah, this was the type of uh, behavior I thought that uh, that Tampa would have to keep, them, keep an eye out on, because you know, over the past few years, Antonio Brown has done things, antics, actions, whatever the case you may be, that has cause for concern about, not just for how it impacts the rest of the team, but for his own self, for his own well-being. His actions and behavior, especially his behavior in particular, uh, has created those causes for concern when you consider the fact he had such weird wild public episodes before and this is in regards into before he even signed with the patriots remember the ugly divorce he had for the steelers 
and then the whole wild, um, weird, quick saga with, with, with the Raiders. That was before he even got to New England. Then when you uh, add in the fact that he had his own investigations being opened up on him at that same time, the dude was not really helping himself out matters as well with his outbursts, with his behavior, with things that he was doing or was not doing or was not supposed to be doing it in any way to where the point where it was just too much of a hassle and a headache to even want to deal with this crap. That's why you saw Pittsburgh uh, saying goodbye. That's why you saw the Raiders saying goodbye. And unfortunately, even the New England Patriots couldn't do anything about it. Now, I will say uh, the fact that Tom Brady uh, clearly um, a question has shown then and even now that he absolutely wants and needs Antonio Brown on his team. Um, that's pretty much his only saving grace at this point. Otherwise, I would see him as, as a guy that uh, who really should be, not be anywhere near a football field right now because you don't know how screwed or scrambled up his head may be right now. Everybody knows the big bad hit that he took from Vontez Perfect all those years back in that playoff game. People say that was the, the start and the cause and the root of his, of his troubles that he's going through right now. I don't know. I'm not a neurologist. I'm not a head expert. I'm not a, a guy that studies uh, concussions and whatnot. But I can tell you is that uh, things in terms of his actions and his antics have increased uh, drastically and dramatically uh, from that moment on in that playoff game when he took that hit up to now. And when you see him act out the way he does, it, it gives you a pause and also just a, a concern as to, as to why, what is a grown man that is the age of Antonio uh, and what he's doing and knowing his position full well, who he is and what he is and what he brings to the table, what he represents, why in the world would you willingly and openly go out and act, uh, act out in this manner and fashion? So it has to be much deeper than what's going on beyond the surface. Will we ever find out fully and completely? I don't know. But in any event, I am wishing Antonio the best and can only hope that, you know, with these episodes or whatever, that, whatever it is, is that um, that he's getting the right help that he needs, uh, not just for those around him, but especially for himself, because that's, that's his, that should be his main priority, protecting, looking out for it, taking care of himself. All right, so... Uh... The Tampa Bay Buccaneers have not taken any action as of late, and likely they probably won't. Frank, you're up next. Justify it as best you can. Um, I think this was a pretty open and shut matter. I mean, Antonio Brown had an incident where he lost his cool. He owned up to it. He paid for the damage that he did, and he apologized to the right people, and no charges were filed. And I figured the Buccaneers front office said, okay, uh, yeah, you acted out, but you did the right thing by apologizing and owning up to it and fixing what was damaged. So that's good enough for us. Now just keep your head in the right place and go out there and make plays on the field. And that's pretty much the end of that. Yes, sir. So that was one of our top stories right there. Now to college football. The Michigan State Spartans got blanked. They got shut out. They got bageled 24 nothing by the Indiana Hoosiers, who scored all their 24 points in the first half. Mm. Their offense definitely couldn't get anything going on at all, while their defense uh, was flat, especially in the first half. Ed, we'll start with you, and then we'll go over to Frank. Ed? Rip them in half. Well, what else can I do to rip in half what's already been done by the likes of Indiana and Rutgers and Iowa? You know, this is a team that has gone through enough ripping in half, so to, uh, to say the least. I'm just, uh, I wouldn't be adding any more by piling on. But none, nonetheless, this was an obvious growing pains game for Mel Tucker as he tries to figure out what he wants for his team going forward. As you can see, uh, Rocky Lombardi did not play in this game. I wasn't quite aware. I wasn't following. I don't know if it was injury or based on play slash coach's decision. But either way, uh, we saw someone else get a chance at the QB spot. And as the, obviously you can see the results, but also credit to Indiana. Uh, we've got to mention the fact that this is an Indiana team that is now still undefeated, now ranked in the top 10, now is seen as a potential dark horse for any potential Big Ten or, dare I say, playoff implications. They have some guys uh, and some players here who can absolutely go with Penix Jr., with Scott, with Fry, with Fry Foggle with over 200 yard reception. Uh, it's a versatile team uh, that we have not seen in years past who can do it all, essentially. So I wasn't too surprised by what MSU did or did not do, but more so impressed with what Indiana could do, knowing that they handled Michigan the way they did, knowing what they did with MSU. So... 
Yeah, I'm still pretty shocked that MSU didn't even score a single point. Frank? Well, I mean, I wasn't really surprised with Indiana winning. I was a little bit surprised with shutting Michigan State out. But then again, I can't remember the last time I saw Indiana shut anyone out for that matter. As they haven't been known for defense. But you know what? The one thing I do have to credit Indiana for was staying focused on the task at hand. They were coming off of a big win over Michigan, something they hadn't done since 1987. And this game had fallen right in between that game and a game at Ohio State. So you know what? Tom Allen and the company stayed focused, took care of business. And, I mean, I know, as mentioned, Michael Penix Jr., I've said that he's the best quarterback in the Big Ten, not named Justin Fields. Stevie Scott, a really good running back. You mentioned Ty Freifogel, a receiver. Another good one in Watt Fillier, who I've been high on. But as for Michigan State, I mean, to what Ed said, Rocky Lombardi did actually start and play this game, but because of poor performance, he was benched and replaced by Peyton Thorne. I mean, he wasn't that much better. Thorne showed that he was not afraid to scramble at times and run all his own number and run. I mean, he's still kind of raw, so I think he'll get better as time goes on. I don't know if he'll end up playing this week against Maryland. That is, if Maryland is still playing, because last week Maryland did not play due to COVID issues against Ohio State. So, I mean, I believe as of right now, that game is still on. If it does get played, it'll be interesting to see if Thorne remains a quarterback and if other guys like Ricky White, Jordan Simmons, and Jaden Reed can continue to play better as well. I mean, defensively, I think you're starting to see the defense kind of come to their own. I mean, they did register some key takeaways against Indiana, and guys were playing better. I mean, Indiana would get the ball via turnover deep in Michigan State territory, and then the defense would hold them to a field goal attempt. So, I mean, I'll take that as a positive, and things are going in the right direction there for Scotty Hazleton. But with regards to this coming game, I mean, that is, if it's going to be played, I'm really not sure how well Michigan State will play because Maryland seems to have gotten up off the mat after a dreadful performance against Northwestern in Week 1 with uh, Talia Tagovailoa, Tua Tagovailoa's little brother at quarterback. I mean... And, of course, Mike Loxley, their head coach, has really done a nice job with their offense. And I think that Maryland is probably about the third best team in the East right now. But we'll see what happens, especially if the game does get played. If it does not get played, then that may not be the worst thing for Michigan State, at least in terms of going out and getting your ass handed to you again. But only time will tell. So we'll see what happens, and I'm sure we'll make our picks coming up in a moment. Definitely. I want to touch on Indiana. Um, They're at Ohio State. I actually uh, picked Indiana to beat Ohio State by taking the points with the Vigit app. And speaking of the Vigit app, we're going to go to uh, the uh, preview at the Maryland Terrapin Saturday at noon on BTN. And then we're going to predict the score with the Vigit predicted score segment. I'm going to go with uh, Maryland 34 and Michigan State 13. Ed, we'll start with you and then we'll go to Frank. This is a team that's trying to find its identity right now in more ways than one. And I could see them putting on a bit a better effort against Maryland that we've seen in the recent weeks. But knowing the fact that the, the gauntlet that they have coming up ahead of them, this is their best chance, I feel, to snatch a win for the remainder of this season. I don't know if that's going to happen in this one, but thankfully for them at least, at least they beat a bad Michigan team to get that, that long win earlier. So for that, I will say that my predicted from Vigit score is going to be Maryland 26, MSU 21. I think it'll be much closer than expected, but uh, Maryland still gets the win. All right. Frank? I'm obviously looking for Michigan State's offense to be better. I mean, they've hit rock bottom, seven points in the last two games. I mean, I'm looking to see if Peyton Thorne can make some more plays, whether it's running or passing the ball. Can Jordan Simmons get the ground game going as well? And receivers Ricky White, Jalen Naylor, Jaden Reed. 
Can they get involved as well? So my prediction for the predicted presented by Vigit, I'm going to go Maryland 28, Michigan State 14. All right. Every Vigit predicted score segment is brought to you by Vigit, where sports fans influence more and more people to love sports. Download the app, sign up, and use the referral code STAPLES with a capital S and a B in the middle. The Vigit app, referral code STAPLES with a capital S and the B in the middle. Now for the Michigan Wolverines, they got destroyed by the Wisconsin Badgers, 49-11, to 11, just a total mismatch. Joe Milton underperformed just like Rocky Lombardi, and now Cade McNamara got some reps in, and there may be a quarterback starting change heading into uh, Rutgers on the road. But, uh, Ed, we want you to dissect this Wisconsin massacre in Ann Arbor first, and then we'll go to Frank. Ed, well, it, it. It, it doesn't surprise me seeing how flat they looked against Michigan State, how absolutely dreadful they looked against Indiana, that this type of score and this type of game was going to happen. Because Wisconsin is a far better team than either of those, than either of those two that I have already mentioned. So knowing that, knowing what was going to be on the horizon there, it doesn't surprise me. Does it surprise me uh, that this type of uh, demolition would happen? No. If you've seen... What Michigan's uh, previous performances have been at the start of this season, no. A game like this was absolutely uh, a, a foreseeable thing that could have occurred, for sure. For Wisconsin, they did what they were supposed to do uh, in terms of beating you up uh, up front, with their, and, and my goodness, just beating you over the head with their running attack. They are known for their big uglies with their offensive line, um, establishing and getting help for their uh, for their rushing attack to take hold. And what we saw here, as a team, they ran for over 340 yards, five touchdowns. This was a quintessential blueprint Wisconsin Badgers game and they absolutely beat the holy hell out of the Michigan Wolverines and for good reason too. Let's not forget um, uh, the little beating that they put, that Michigan had put on them in prime time two years ago in, in Ann Arbor which kind of coincidentally uh, kick-started that whole revenge tour uh, theme that got ended by Ohio State in, in brutal fashion. So I think Wisconsin obviously had not forgotten about that and they wanted to get their own little slither of revenge here so they waited for the right time to do it. They waited until Michigan essentially has been bottom has has started to bottom out, and now um, it's just an even worse loss on an already bad season that seems to be getting worse and worse. And for the players itself, again, I don't know if this is a scenario to where it may be very well the fact that this team is quitting on Harbaugh. Uh, it'll be horrible. Uh, a bad way to, for his tenure to end, if that was the case, maybe. But I think it could be a pattern reoccurring itself where we're seeing eventually uh, Harbaugh is starting to wear out his welcome. His results, his antics or whatever it is, it's not worth putting up with if you're not producing where it matters most. If you're not getting wins that's going to put you closer to a Big Ten title. If you're not beating Ohio State, now you can't even beat Michigan State. You know, doing things like that. Uh, to the point where we're seeing this, and now people are overly questioning or wondering, you know, shoot, are, are, they, are they even going to let him finish out this season? Now, obviously, I think they will with the money that they're paying him and whatnot, but uh, this was not what they were expecting, far from what they were expecting. Uh, I don't know how the rest of the season is going to go. I know if they're going to pull an Earl Bruce and fire him right before Ohio State, or if their minds have already made up and they're waiting for the season in, I just do not know for certain. What I do know is that this is an absolute and has been an absolute disaster of a season for Michigan, and I can't wait until I can't wait for it until to be over. But uh, that means we still got to go through one more horrific beating at the ends of Ohio State first. But uh, you know, we'll cross that bridge when we get there. Definitely, I can't wait until that Ohio State game is all said and done and over with. Frank, your thoughts on the Wisconsin-Michigan debacle or massacre, whichever I may call it. Go ahead. Well, this is the second straight year that Wisconsin has massacred the Wolverines. And I'm going to throw out a number for both of you gentlemen. That's the number 700. As in, Wisconsin in the last two meetings has piled up over 700 yards Mm. rushing. Whoa! Think about that. That's last year in Madison and this year in Ann Arbor. Now, obviously, scoreboard-wise, this beatdown was even worse, but also consider this. This is Wisconsin's first game back from not being able to play due to a COVID outbreak, and they basically just ran a Tecmo Bowl version of their playbook where it was just run, run reverse, run counter, run jet sweep, and pass. That was the only plays they had, and... 
Michigan just could not stop it. And it all goes back to kind of what Ed said. This team has quit. Because if this is a team that won, that was trying to play for pride or at least trying to save face, you would have thought they would have made adjustments or rose up and did something. No, they just stayed there and assumed the position and said, okay, Wisconsin, we're going to take our beating. Have at it. And that's what happened. Now, the one thing I will say that Michigan did do well, which there wasn't much, unlike what Jim Harbaugh says, or he says he didn't see a lot of stuff wrong. I'm not sure what you were watching, Jim. But going to Cade McNamara to replace Joe Milton, I think is somewhat interesting. Because maybe it's starting to say that, you know what, Joe Milton wasn't getting the job done, so let's give somebody else a shot. I mean, McNamara, for what it's worth, did end up going 4-for-4 four four in his first series and throwing a touchdown pass. So, okay, all well and good, first start. Now, I don't know if that's going to mean he plays against Rutgers and starts, or if he sees some form playing time, but we'll see. At least he made the most of his opportunity. So I think that's the one. If there is a positive to take from it, it's his performance and limited action. But also, going back to the big picture, I believe that it's getting to the end of the line for Jim Harbaugh. I'm not going to say the university is going to fire him because there's a lot of money involved. I don't, they definitely won't fire him before his season's end, unless something crazy happens. But I think that after the presumed beatdown against Ohio State, which will be Houston SMU style in the 90s, that they will announce that they are mutually parting ways and, go, and moving on and wherever Jim goes. I don't know. That's something we'll probably have to see when the time comes. But it's basically been a complete disaster and failure for Michigan, especially when you were expected to be near the top of the division. I don't think many works. I don't think anyone was expecting you to dethrone Ohio State. But starting out with one win against a god awful Minnesota team, you lose to Michigan State, who is bad in their own right. It's gotten to be a mess, and. I will, and of course, I did share with you guys a piece from Greg Henson that he believes that this is the end of the line for Harbaugh. Yeah, and, at and the Henson, end of the- and Henson himself would know about being up close and personal with scoops and information in regards to Jim Harbaugh in Michigan. Let's not forget he, along with Jeff Moss, will probably be the only two who called Harbaugh going to Michigan from the very start, and that was while. You know, the rest of the, the, the local sports media was making themselves look like fools trying to discredit it, saying, no, nothing's happening, nothing's happening, and then boom, it happened. So this is what well, Ed, I would... Well, and it's interesting you do say that, because I, I saw some tweets from John U. Bacon saying that the reports that Harbaugh was going to be gone were mostly BS. Now, he worded it mostly, because the, the Henson one, I did notice that Henson said that it was the same people who told him that Harbaugh was coming. Yep. So that kind of leads me to believe that in Henson's article, there is at least some kernel of truth to it. And not to mention the fact, don't get me wrong, I love me some John U. Bacon. Don't get me wrong, he is, an, he is the go-to guy if you want your history on, on any and all things Michigan football but i think he was just more so showing his side so to speak showing his showing his hand of uh i don't know if you want to call it slight bias or whatever but um he was showing his hand a little bit because i do believe that the way things are going and the way they have been even before this year bottoming out like this i wouldn't be surprised if a move gets made i know there's still money on the table but my, but my god man look at this look at this mess you can't there's no way there's no spin to, to get out of this can't deflect from this at all and i just saw that the uh, portland trailblazers going back to the nba draft at the 16th overall pick we heard earlier that the detroit pistons have traded for the 16th overall pick and trevor ariza with the houston rockets but now the portland trailblazers had that 16 round pick i don't know what happened there but, i guess uh, they flipped it they used that pick and flipped it back to portland for something else i'm not certain but that would be my my best guess is they, they probably get that so they can flip it or for something else Oh, wait, hold on a second. I just got word from CBS Sports. The Houston Rockets are trading Robert Covington to Portland for Trevor Ariza and the 16th overall pick. The Rockets then trading Ariza and the rights to the number 16th overall pick to the Detroit Pistons for a future first-round pick. So uh, the Pistons are still getting Ariza and that 16th overall pick. So uh, right now, Portland 
the pick is in. Portland was on the clock just now. The pick is in, but um, I think the uh, trade uh, may be uh, at least possible, maybe official. So I just got word from CBS Sports that the Rockets are Robert. The Rockets are trading Robert Covington to the Blazers for Trevor Ariza and the 16th overall pick, and then the Rockets trading Ariza and rights to the 16th overall pick to the Detroit Pistons for that future first round pick. So, so it's the Rockets that's doing the flipping then. Okay, that makes more sense because they're trying to yeah. get their, their roster together because they're on the verge of not only shipping out James Harden, but also Russell Westbrook as well. So they need to get all the ducks they can in a row, get all the assets they can get because it's rebuild time in Houston. It was it was it was it was it was, it was not official when Golden State broke them a couple years ago, but um, it's definitely now official after the Lakers put them away. Yep, yeah, definitely. I must have missed it earlier where uh, the Robert Covington deal went down in exchange for reason, obviously the pick. So thank this you for pointing that, Taylor. Isaiah Stewart, a center from Washington, first initially drafted by the Portland Trail Blazers, mm. going to be traded to the Rockets first along with a 16th overall pick. And then the Rockets are going to trade Isaiah Stewart and Trevor Reza to the Pistons later on after this first round sometime is all said and done. So we just Trevor got a big Reza man and Isaiah Stewart both to the Pistons. Yes, sir. We just got ourselves a big man because I, I figured that was something that we needed to address, knowing that a we traded Andre Drummond and b you're not really quite so certain as to what as to whether or not you're going to pay Christian Wood. So yeah, you would probably get try to do your best to get a big man uh, as much as you can. Definitely. So uh, let's uh, grade this baby. Isaiah Stewart, center for Washington, and Trevor Ariza. How do you grade the trade now, Ed? Um, I'll give it a B plus because it addresses a position of need for sure. Yeah. And and I think with uh, with Isaiah Stewart, right there. yeah, with Isaiah Stewart, what he brings to the table, uh, I think he can learn under Blake for certain. But his size, what he's six nine, two fifty, so you could plug him in at the center as well. But uh, yeah, he's definitely someone that you needed for big man help and depth. And, uh, hey, I just noticed, looking at uh, his uh, quick profile, we shared the same birthday. So, May 22nd, Team Gemini. I approve. So, yes, B+. Plus. I know it's, 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 it's slightly out there for rationale reasoning, but it's my pick and my rule. So, that's what I'm doing. Definitely. My grade's a B plus as well. Frank, how about yours? Let's make it three for three with a B plus. I'm actually reading the uh, article on the score right now, and... This is a quote that Stewart had. It said, hard work, running the floor, rebounding, and just doing the little things that may not show up on the stat sheet. That's stuff that he brings to the table, which as someone who helps coach high school ball, it's uh, we tell players, always do the little things that may not show up in the box score at the end of the night. So I, that's something I approve of, too. His size is decent in strengths. Lead strength and physical dimensions recorded the second longest wingspan at the draft combine. Good scoring touch around the basket with enough shooting ability to extend his range. So I would say, I mean, obviously he's going to have to work on uh, getting out to defend the perimeter, and he's not really that type of... He's not a shot stretch. Over. Yeah, he's not, he, but he's also not a true rim protector either. Mm-hmm. But the thing is, the guy, but the guy's going to go out, work hard, and bust his ass, and continue to get better. So if he brings that work ethic to the Pistons, I approve of it. So I'm going to give I, it a B plus. And I think we all do. To, and I think he's going to the right team, and especially the right coach and Dwayne Casey, who are going to want to emphasize uh, those key fundamentals of work ethic. So uh, this is another reason why I approve of this pick and approve this, of this move as well. Definitely. I just saw that swat by uh, Isaiah Stewart for Washington. At least he can block shots. He swatted that thing. He can uh, take that rock to the post and jam it over a defender. Wow. He's got a lot of it. Like you pointed out, Frank, he's not a true rim protector, but he's got a lot of skills and talent and blocking shots and uh, taking the rock to the rack and jamming it home over a defender. It's really those are the things you need as a center. Other elements may still need work, but uh, Isaiah Stewart's a really good pick for the Pistons to uh, trade for with the uh, Houston Rockets and the Portland Trailblazers. So I give it a B plus. So let's get back to college football and the Michigan Wolverines. They're at Rutgers against the Scarlet Knights Saturday at 730 on BTN. Ed, give the analysis and the uh, Vigit predicted score brought to you by Vigit. Well, the analysis of this is this is two this is two teams. Um, this is a, a battle I'm sure not people were, were expecting. The battle of the one and three teams between Michigan and Rutgers 
Ooh, joy. Get out the popcorn on that one. But in all seriousness, um, I think if you're Michigan, it would be wise to pay attention to how uh, Rutgers smoked MSU earlier this season, particularly with the, the play of their, excuse me, of their quarterback, of their quarterback, Vidral, who, aside from that, has had a very below-average pedestrian season. He has more interceptions does he have, than he has touchdown passes. The rest of the team itself, they are what they are. That's the reason why they do have one win. Yes, they, they do look better in some areas, but they're still Rutgers. And for the love of God, if you lose to Rutgers, then I don't I have no defense for you whatsoever. I don't even, I even I don't even care about the spread at this point. It could be Michigan minus three or Michigan minus ten. I don't care. As long as they win the game by by a point. That's all that matters to me. Just win the game. But um I think Michigan they should keyword should uh, be able to do what, what's necessary, do enough and get the win. But I, I can't, I can't make that promise in good faith or conscience. But I will say, uh, if you're going to force me to make a pick, my predicted from Vigit score would be Michigan 35, Rutgers 24. All right, I got some breaking news here. Oh snap! Yeah. Whoa. The Clippers are. Yeah. The Clippers are sending the number 19 pick via the Brooklyn Nets to the Pistons and receiving Luke Kennard. Wow. The Nets Whoa. received Larry Troy Weaver Shamet. making some moves. Oh he is my not God. playing. He is Luke not Kennard. playing. Luke Kennard is gone from Detroit. Mm. Oh, my God. Mm. I figured that was going to happen because I, I I just didn't see Luke making that type of explosion to where you're going to want to pay him $15, $16 million a year. I just didn't see that happening. I was very hesitant on labeling him as a future, uh, a team, a, a core of the future type of piece, knowing that they tried to look up deals for him last year. So, yeah, they got this one. Uh, they did what they had to do. And like I said, you got another asset. You got more draft capita. Uh, you could use that to flip it or potentially get something, uh, get a, a bigger prize down the line. So big move, but a necessary one. Wow, yeah. So Luke Kennard, so the Pistons lose a valuable three-point shooter in Luke Kennard. But all that being said, the Pistons get the number 19th pick. And in other words, we're not done yet with NBA draft coverage here on the Michigan Sports Truth Podcast primetime edition on Stables Media. So we're going to keep an eye on that. Pick number 19 is uh, going to be in like 255 left. But, Frank, we're going to go to uh, you for Michigan and Rutgers with the Vigit predicted score. Frank, take it away. Oh, man. If you would have told me before the season started that both Michigan and Rutgers would beat each other with a combined two wins between them, I probably would have asked you for winning lottery numbers because I would have never seen this coming. My biggest thing is, can Michigan finally get up off the mat? I know that Ed and I have said that it looks like they've quit. They're beaten down, and Rutgers... To Greg Schiano's credit, even though they've only won one game, this isn't the same old Rutgers that has been getting beaten down constantly like they did four years ago when Michigan came into Piscataway and dropped a 78 nothing bomb on them. And I'm sure you remember that quite well. Uh-huh. So Rutgers will compete. They're going to play hard. I mean, I'm not overly impressed by the draw their quarterback. But then again... I'm not really impressed by Joe Milton either, and if this coaching staff does have any common sense left, they will likely go with Cade McNamara, and he'll be making his first start on the road in New Jersey. So we'll see how that goes. I think if they go with him, I think he gives them a better chance to win. And of course, but Rutgers, meanwhile, they have guys who can play. I mean, I mentioned Vidrales. He's all right as a quarterback, not special, but they've got... but. I mentioned many a time about how Shiano brought in nine guys from the transfer portal in this offseason. One of them should be familiar to you, Ed. One, Mr. Michael Dwumfor on their defensive uh-huh. line, who he has been playing quite well for them. I might and, another, and another thing, too, for Shiano is that his teams aren't going to quit. I mean, I knew that... I watched a little bit of their game against Ohio State a couple weeks ago, and they were down big, big in the second half, and they actually just kept playing, and they battled back, and they covered the spread. So, and of course, they were doing a double pass on a punt or something like that. So, who knows? I think they'll probably get creative with some trick plays here and there. So, I mean... I'm tempted to go Rutgers in this one. The spread is Michigan minus eight and a half. 
the last check. So I would say if I was betting this one, I would probably take the points. But I'm just going to go ahead and say Michigan will squeak one out by the skin of their teeth. So my predicted score presented by the Vigit Sports app is well, Michigan 24, Rutgers 23. All right. My Vigit predicted score is going to be bold. Guys, get ready for this one. Oh, God. Oh, boy. Rutgers 27, Michigan 24. No. Oh. Because Michigan's defense sucks, and Rutgers, despite having only one win, is a pretty upstart team. The way they beat Michigan State, wow, yikes. Yeah, that'll tell you something right there. I know they lost to Indiana. Indiana is a better team. They even got a shot at Ohio State this Saturday. But I think Rutgers can beat Michigan the way Michigan has been playing poorly. So the pick is in for the uh, Brooklyn Nets, who are going to be uh, trading to the uh, Clippers and then the Detroit Pistons. The Clippers are going to get Luke Kennard in this three-way trade. Yikes. Uh, it's, it's, it's like Troy Weaver wants to single-handedly exercise everything that was Stan Van Gundy in regards to this team. <laughs> yeah, let's listen in. Sadiq Bey, a, point, a power forward from mm. Villanova. Okay. So uh, what's your grade on that one? Uh, I gotta look up. I gotta need when I get second a chance to look up Steve Bay more. But the fact that they're going another big man uh, lets me to believe that this is a definite rebuild movement uh, that Troy Weaver is doing right now. I don't know how the hell he's gonna be able to flip Blake Griffin, but if he can, I want to build a statue for him right now. But um, I'm already loving the moves that he's doing so far, and I see the the road or the plan, the blueprint that he's trying to do here. It's not for forget what he did in OKC, folks. People need to forget, need to start remember that. It wasn't just Sam Presti, but the whole nine yards, okay? So for this one, I will say this is a solid B, but I just needed to uh, look up more what, 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 and what I see in Steve Bay. But he's an improved shooter and an active defender. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Defense, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm bringing that to a B plus. There you go. Now we're talking. Sadiq, pay a power forward from Villanova. Let's take a look at those highlights. A long two from the right wing for Villanova. And then he can drive to the rack, a free throw line jump shot, fade away. And then he uh, had a block right there and then a steal going on a fast break, splitting two defenders and then laying it up and in down the lane. Oh, man. He's a two-way player. He is. Frank, what's your grade on that? Well, I'm going to give this a B-plus as well because Ed mentioned his defense, which, of course, I, me being a kind of a disciple of a defensive-minded coach, I love it a lot. So, I mean, I'd like to see what he can do more. I mean, I only got to see, like, bits and pieces from him this last season at Villanova. But, again, he comes from a very strong college program with a very good college coach. So, I also want to say that Troy Weaver is definitely following the book of Sam Presti, Oklahoma City's GM. Because Presti has been known to make a ton of moves and get assets. I mean, he did it earlier this week by sending Chris Paul to the Phoenix Suns. So, I guess uh, Weaver is... Telling him is saying what his uh, mentor did and said, okay, you know what? I can do that too. So he basically flips Luke Kennard and gets Bay as a result. As I just got the alert from the score, and I'll see what this the six built on Magruder. Yeah. Oh, he was. Was he, a, was he part of that deal too? Yeah, he's mm. heading to Detroit. Huh. Oh, okay. Yeah. So the Pistons get two players in that trade as well. Bay hey. and. So in, one, so in one night, Troy Weaver has damn near overhauled the complete roster. Oh, man. Troy, He's on Troy, fire tonight. Troy Weaver, Troy Weaver managed to do in one night what Bob Quinton couldn't do in three or four. Oh, in the first round. Wow. Oh, my God. You know, you know, guys, I'm starting to wonder if uh, <laughs> Troy Weaver around. had some contact with Steve Eiserman as well. See, I'm <laughs> telling you, I'm telling you, I just, I, just, I just chatted with my friend, with one of my friends, Troy Weaver, is not effing around here. Uh, Spread the word about our podcast and the Vigit app, please. Oh, yeah. Get them to sign up. Yeah, tell them to use the referral code STABLES with a capital S and a B. So, with all that being cleared up, let's get to the Lions. They blew a 24-3 lead. They went 30-27 to over the Washington football team on a game-winning 59-yard field goal by Matt Prater as time ran out. He finished 3-for-3 three three in field goal attempts. Also, the uh, pass interference call on Trufant was actually correct, believe it or not. I saw plenty of contact on the replay and then another penalty on him, allowing the Washington football team to tie it at 27 with a field goal from Dustin Hopkins with 21 seconds left and then... DeAndre Swift, a touchdown catch, making it 
24-3. Early in that third quarter, a touchdown catch, 16 carries for 81 rushing yards. Adrian Peterson, only four rushes for 21 yards. Adrian Peterson's just losing his um, Well, that should begin. His, that should be, that should be even, at, at running back. That should be even more further proof that this is, this, is, this is going to be and should be DeAndre Swift's team moving forward. Yeah, true. But uh, Lions, uh, they prove that they're not tanking for Trevor Lawrence, of course. They're 4-5 and five with that win, despite what some may think is referee controversy, which actually it isn't. Like I said, I just saw the contact by Trufant that allowed Washington to only tie the game and not win it. Wow, only with a field goal with Dustin Hopkins. And then just a frantic drive by Matthew Stafford. And then when he overthrew Cephas, he uh, got hit from behind, and the football team got flagged for roughing the passer, allowing the Lions to uh, march... Uh, closer to midfield and then that Marvin Jones short catch with three seconds left and then Matt Patricia called the Lions second timeout allowing Matt Prater to uh, nail the game winning field goal it looked to me like he was going to miss it but it was a knuckler it hung in there it had the accuracy and the distance and it was good at the buzzer and I went crazy a 59 yard field goal first win at home for the Lions wow but um They got the Carolina Panthers next, but uh, Ed, we'll start with you and then we'll go to Frank. Ed, uh, what were your thoughts on uh, the uh, Lions win 30-27 to over the Washington football team? Thoughts are they're lucky to win this one because when you blow a 21-point lead, uh, when you blow yet another lead in this season to a team that uh, is frantically struggling in an absolute garbage pile of a division in the NFC East, a team that you know, is starting a quarterback at Alex Smith who, what, just two years ago, we didn't even know if he was going to play a a game of football again or even walk again, okay? By the way, credit to Alex Smith, though, uh, and all, you know, I I know it sounds like I'm busting his balls, but uh, let's let's be honest, for him to go through what he did and then come back and perform in the manner that he did, absolutely commendable. Hats off to him. He looked great, and then we still got the win. That's a professional situation, uh, professional wrestling uh, situation analysis where you can say everybody went over because that's what happened. In regards to the rest of the game, it was nice to see other players for the offense step up for Matthew Stafford other than Kenny Galladay or TJ Hawkinson. Seeing Marvin Jones produce for 96 yards and a touchdown, seeing that Stafford was trying to target Cephas as much as he could, and he almost got him. Because remember, on that play, which uh, you mentioned the penalty, Taylor, it was, of all people, Chase Young who blindsided Stafford on that. But on that very play, Stafford almost had Cephas for what looked to be uh, a game-winning touchdown, but he just overthrew him by just a smidge, but it was right there. As for Stafford himself, I thought he looked as good as he could, knowing for a fact that he played with, what, an injured thumb that he uh, essentially injured in the first quarter and played the rest of the way with, and yet he still had only nine incompletions, three touchdowns, and zero picks. Quality, quality start by Stafford. In regards, though, to his thumb injury, I know it, it said that it was that he had a negative test on it, or negative x-ray, I should say, but uh, I will still keep an eye on that because whenever Stafford has taken an injury to his hand, specifically his throwing hand, and that's the injury where that thumb injury is currently at, it's affected his performance and his play, and it's led to less than flattering results for him and for the team. So uh, that's definitely, if there was one X factor to keep an eye on for this next game of the rest of the season, it will be Stafford's thumb. And again, a scenario, a situation in which I'm saying the same exact race, you ride or die with Matthew Stafford. If he goes where you go, if he if he goes down for the rest of the year, then you're kaput. So it's it doesn't, it doesn't surprise me. And, and to see what he did again with 16 seconds left, you know, it doesn't matter if it's three timeouts or zero timeouts. If I got enough time on the clock and knowing of what he needs to get, I'm trusting number nine. And he proved that again on Sunday. He did. Chase Young, what were you thinking? The Lions got a break courtesy of him. Wow. Frank, follow up. Well, despite blowing a 21-point lead in Atlanta Falcons-esque fashion, Matt Stafford was able to lead them to another win, albeit thanks to a dumb penalty by Chase Young. But I will give credit where it is due, and like Ed said, Stafford got him to the win. And then Matt Prater delivered with a 59-yard field goal at the gun to win the game. And, of course, I'm interested to see how well this, how bad this thumb injury is. I know the x-rays came back negative, but the torn ligament, that's a bit of a concern. I'm not sure if he'll be able to go against Carolina this Sunday or not, but 
like I said, you ride or die with Stafford. If he can play, you've at least got some form of a shot to win. If he doesn't, then your season is cooked. And I guess we'll go ahead and preview this Sunday's game against the Panthers. Yes, let's do that with one more Vigit Predicted Score segment brought to you by Vigit. Lions at Panthers, Sunday at 1 on Fox. Matthew Stafford has a partially torn ligament in his thumb, but he didn't need surgery. According to multiple reports, they say he will still play. And Carolina Panthers running back Christian McCaffrey is out with a shoulder injury. And will start with you again. Wow. Oh, man. That, that was just my big X factor that I was going to say because we know for a fact that the Lions have had horrific issues stopping running backs. We saw what Dalvin Cook did to them about a couple weeks back. So knowing that Carolina is not going to be without their biggest playmaker, that is huge. As for the rest of the game itself, this could be another back-and-forth one like we saw because, I, I again, the Lions itself, they're not that good as a team. So against teams that are bad, that are struggling, like Washington, like Carolina, even though you expect them to, to at least dominate or blow them out, it's not the case, I mean, which is why I'm looking at ESPN. Even knowing that the Carolina Panthers are still a one-and-a-half-point favorite for this for this upcoming Sunday. So that alone should tell you to... Uh, uh, um, of the confidence or lack thereof that people have in this team right now. Teddy Bridgewater has been very good. I will give them that. Uh, but they're going to need a lot more of that uh, to have a chance in this game, knowing that Christian McCaffrey is out. But we'll see how it goes. I'm not, again, uh, my inertia in terms of predicting things has been way off back and forth. I don't know what to expect from this game. Uh, Detroit has law has won three of their last five, whereas Carolina has lost five in a row. You would think... Um, on paper alone, this should speak to a Lions win, if not emphatically so. But this is the Lions, so I wouldn't be surprised if this is back and forth, a close one yet again. But on the side of caution, I am going to pick, probably with uh, against my uh, best knowledge and best judgment, I'm going to pick the Lions. My predicted from Vigit score is going to be Detroit 31, Carolina 26. All right. Frank, what is your Vigit predicted score? Well, obviously with Christian McCaffrey out for the Panthers, that... It's a big loss for them. However, as I mentioned, they still have Teddy Bridgewater, who's played very well at quarterback. And some other guys Carolina has. They have Curtis Samuel, who is a receiver. Sorry, Ed, if I'm bringing back bad memories for you. And they also have DJ Moore, who's solid in his own right. So Carolina still has guys who can cause you problems. So with that said, I think it's going to be no CNC. No problem. My predicted score presented by the Bigot Sports app. I'm going to go with Carolina 28, Lions 24. By the way, Frank, um, Curtis Samuel, that's this, uh, in regards to that, just three words. JT was short. That is all. He was. But Harbaugh still had that timeout left. He didn't call it. Wow. Yep. Anyway. He could have he told his guy, you know what? Man up and stop here. But yep. right. they did. It's on him. Yep, definitely. I'm gonna pick. Um, I'm gonna pick Panthers 24, Lions 20. I'm still gonna be skeptical with, with this. Uh, yes, Christian McCaffrey is out, but uh, the Lions still uh, are probably not gonna provide enough offense to beat this Carolina team, and their defense uh, still can't make enough tackles. 24 to 20, Carolina. That's my Vigit predicted score. Brought to you by the new sports app called Big It. Referral code STABLES with a capital S. So, I believe uh, we've covered everything Pistons in terms of the NBA draft. If there's more later on, we'll uh, probably go on Periscope later on. So, uh, let's go to our closing statement before we uh, wrap this up. Ed, we'll start with you. Then we'll go to Frank. The closing statement theme that I'm going to focus on today is new dawn and new beginnings. Because what we're seeing right now in regards to our sports teams, and quite frankly uh, with our way of life, is something that you would say on the verge or on the realm of New Dawn-ish level. Uh, the Red Wings, we saw what Steve Eisman has been doing and will continue to do. The Tigers, they actually made what a solid managerial hire for once in I don't know how long, probably since Jim Leland himself when he first got here. The Pistons, the big, big moves that they've made tonight, and you have uh, no doubt they will continue to make going forward after this night transpires. Even the Lions, for that matter, they essentially got a new dawn uh, on their uh, fighting for the playoff spot because knowing how god how got awful the NFC East is and the rest of the NFC is in general, if you can scrape by with a, let's say, 
a nine and seven or even eight and eight that might get you into the playoffs. But I digress. In terms of new dawns, new beginnings, we're seeing that as a theme pop up all over the place, especially now when our country absolutely needs it the most. So I would say keep those perspectives fresh. Always keep an eye out um, and always be aware. And obviously be as safe as you possibly can. So uh, that's my closing statement on that. And if you're if you're going to see a potential another new dawn soon, I would keep an eye out if I was in Ann Arbor. All right. So, um, Frank, your turn. My closing statement is going to reflect the moves made by a GM, and that would be the moves of Troy Weaver. Now, when he got hired, I initially thought, okay, this is someone who's going to probably do a couple things different here and there. But as I see that he is a disciple of Sam Presti, and I saw the moves that Presti made in his time in Oklahoma City, including recently, and then seeing what Weaver has done as basically saying, okay, I'm going to do something similar to what my mentor has done. That gives me a sense of hope with the Pistons. Something that I haven't had for, gosh, probably since the late 2000s, my first year out of high school, when the team was actually worth a hoot watching. I think the the moves are being made to getting back to respectability. I know it's not going to be done in one night, but you know what? Troy Weaver is that right man in the right place making the right moves to accelerate that process. So it's not taking years and years and years where it takes bad contracts to go away or it takes years of being inept for a long time. No, he's doing it in the quickest way possible. And this is only the beginning. There's still more to come. It's just a matter of what will happen next with these Pistons. Definitely. My closing statement, the future is bright for the Tigers, Red Wings, and Pistons. The future for the Lions, though, bleak until the Fords sell the team either to Jeff Bezos or another guy. Probably just Jeff Bezos, my best option. So before we go, we want to remind everyone once again to download the all-new social sports app called VigIt for sports fans who influence more and more people to love sports. Enter the referral code STAPLES with a capital S and a B in the middle when you sign up. Download the Vigit app and enter the referral code STABLES with a capital S and a B in the middle. Gentlemen, excellent job as always. That concludes another fine episode of the Michigan Sports Troop Podcast, primetime edition on Stables Media. We'll be back next week, and Darren will make his return next week as well. For Ed Smith and Frank Vazner, this is Taylor Phillips signing off. Follow Ed Smith on Twitter, Periscope, and Instagram at EdSmith313. Follow Frank Vazner at Frank underscore Vazner on Twitter, Periscope, and Instagram. And follow me on Twitter, Periscope, and Instagram at DT2Phillips with two L's. Thanks very much for listening, downloading, and sharing. And remember, the truth is out there. TTFN, ta-ta for now. Power to the people. Hit them with a hind. We rest our case. Stay safe. The Michigan Sports Truth Podcast does not represent or defame any of the teams it covers, nor does it represent or compete against any mainstream media in the state of Michigan. It is also not for entertainment or debating purposes. It only detects, exposes, and reveals honest, actual, and hidden truth, facts, and statistics about them. And it is for every sports fan's own good because the truth is out there. (laughs) 